Ron, Tara Austin, welcome. Welcome to the alternative studio, mm -hmm. full of pretend weapons and uh, boys' toys. Thank you for your time. Glad we could rearrange it after the last time. Mm -hmm. Hectic diaries. Very busy. And uh, like I said on the, on the icebreaker, excited to be talking to you. <clears throat> so apart from, we're going to come on to the, the psilis, topic of psilocybin and uh, psychedelic mm -hmm. psychedelics use in medicine and research. Uh, but I was listening to another podcast of yours previously. Uh -oh. You gave a little bio. Behavioral scientist, behavioral science, applied behavioral science. Yeah. Behavioral so what science. is so what is, describe that to me? So I hear yeah. the word applied in different different fields. What does applied mean in, in behavioral mm -hmm. science? Because it concerns me a little bit. I feel like you could persuade me or people to do whatever you want them to do because you understand <laughs> the mind wish. that well. <laughs> Well, I try. I do try. I do try to <laughs> manipulate my way around the world. Um, a, applied behavioral scientist. In I'm not an academic, um, and I, I've actually never studied psychology. I'm the only one in my team, apart from my boss, that I never studied it at university. Um, <coughs> when I was studying behavioral science, degrees didn't exist, and now they are teaching about the work that we've been doing over the last um, eleven years. Um, so I'm a partner in a behavioral science practice in, which is housed within a big ad agency. And that makes a lot of sense because, you know, advertising agencies are trying to influence people. Uh, that's what they're, that's what they're doing. And the behavioral science practice was really set up to do that, to influence people, but without necessarily using posters or 60 second TV ads. And my boss is very fond of saying, uh, you know, if you want an ad campaign, you go to an ad agency. If you want a PR campaign, you go to a PR agency. And you kind of come to us when you want to change people's behavior in some way. You want them to do something, but you don't necessarily know how or why or what the right uh, path might be. And we are very much sort of media agnostic in how we approach a problem. The answer might be changing a process uh, or, um, yeah, something relatively uh, trivial or minor that actually could end up shifting people's behavior quite significantly. Um, so that's, uh, I'm a consultant really now is what you'd call me. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. where, that's what we're here for. Where does, the, <laughs> <laughs> where does the line sit between influence and manipulation? Yep, that's a good question. And the answer is that we're all trying to influence one another all of the time. And whether that's, <coughs> and a lot of the training I do, um, I start off by telling people this is not training, this is more like therapy, because you're going to hopefully by the end of it, understand yourself a lot better. And when you understand yourself a lot better, you can also understand those around you and how you might want to influence them, whether they are your partner or your children or your colleagues or your customers. And obviously the work that we do for the private sector is in great part about helping people, you know, helping businesses get someone to click on a particular link or to get them to follow through and um, sign up to this bank. Uh, because you've all, we've all been through processes where we've got, oh God, this is, this is a pain in the ass, I'm not going to finish this process. And we do a lot of work kind of optimizing those sign up processes, things like that, or, um, you know, how, how do I get these people to take up direct debit? How do I get them to do these things I want them to do because they're good for my business or they're good for my um, organization? We do a lot of work in the public sector as well. Um, uh, but yeah, this uh, it, the line is, I think, what your aims are. That's what it's always been for me. So what is the end? Uh, if the end is bad, if you if you want them to smoke or you want them to be fat or you want them to, you know, uh, something terrible, um, kill one another, maybe. I'm surrounded by guns right now. But um, if you want them to do something bad, then no matter what you, you do, you know, the, the means are are in service of something evil. And what we do is try and understand those means as well as possible. And we do not work for gambling companies and we do not work for tobacco companies. I have worked extensively on vaping, um, on getting people to switch from cigarettes to vaping. Now, some of my colleagues won't do that. They don't want to work uh, for businesses that have anything to do with nicotine. Nicotine is a highly addictive substance. My own view is that the end is absolutely noble and that 
everything I know about harm reduction and, and drug policy is that vaping won't <coughs> kill you, whereas <coughs> cigarettes absolutely will. And I don't have a problem with somebody having an addiction to nicotine if it's not going to kill them. I really do have a problem with it if it is. And so um, I've worked, like I say, extensively on, on getting people to shift uh, to vaping from cigarettes. And I've done that for vaping companies. And I've also done that for Cancer Research UK, who have the same end and the same goal. So wh whether or not it's wrong, I mean, there are, there are frameworks that you can use to look at the ethics of um, any kind of uh, yeah, strategy to influence people. You want people to maintain their agency, I think is for me the biggest area. You want, you want things to, to, to some extent be a choice that they would, would want to make. But at the same time, you know, human beings, we've got too many choices and we've got too much, uh, like uh, the world is overwhelming. And if I can help someone make a decision without even really thinking about it, that's going to be better for their life and the lives of those around them, then I, I do believe in that kind of slightly, uh, what do they call it, paternal uh, liberalism in that, you know, the, there are some decisions that can be made for others, like, like, the de like changing the defaults. Uh, this is the classic example, changing the defaults for the organ donation <coughs> system so that instead of asking people to opt into organ donation, you ask them to opt out. Now, you could argue, you know, that maybe they, you know, that, that switching it around, that, that, that there's some problem in doing that, but organ donation rates go through the roof and the, the decision is still absolutely objectively the same. Do you want to be a donator, or a, a donor or not? Um, and so, you know, that choice is still there. You still have the free agency to opt out of the system. You can still say, I don't want my organs donated, but the great majority of people will not do that. So instead of having 20% donation and 80% not doing it, when you make it the other way around so that you have to opt out, 80% of people will donate by, by virtue of the fact that they cannot be bothered to opt out. Now, in, in our industry, we talk a lot about nudge thinking and nudge nudging people's behavior but the other side of that is is sludge is where you might create a system in which you for example you don't want people to cancel their gym membership and therefore you're going to make it really difficult you're going to make the process really hard oh you've got to phone up this number that's only open at these times of day in order to do this you can you can put more friction into the system now that we'd call sludge, and I'd say that there, the ends are bad. They're not the right ones. They're not pro-social. And I, I like to think that the work that I do and that we all do is, you know, lending itself to to good businesses and, and, and good briefs from the government and other NGOs and things like that, where we're trying to serve people in the way that they want to be served and that the ends are good. Is there a major difference in between how easily influenced, and I'm generalizing obviously, men are to women and women are to men? Not to my knowledge, no. I mean, one of the, there's some really interesting data about things like people who think that they're not influenced by the behavior of others. Uh, you know, in the academic research, they, they, they are, and they are actually influenced slightly more. So, <laughs> so there's some, but men and women, I don't, I haven't seen that data. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you, but there's probably some research out there. <coughs> and this is the thing. So the applied behavioral, you know, behavioral <coughs> scientists, we're really, what we're doing is leaning on the academic data and look and reading and staying as uh, on top of the academic research as we can in order to then apply that to real world problems. And um, there's a lot of testing that we have to do to work out what is the right strategy. We can say these different, um, these different strategies might work based on the academic data. And then we try and test and learn uh, from that. And sometimes we test and realize that something we've suggested um, absolutely doesn't work or it backfires. Uh, and that is the nature of the human species is we're just so wonderfully varied and uh, contextual and every little detail matters. And sometimes we, sometimes you get it wrong, but you can also learn in, in that process. I think we did a piece of work. We're in Westminster right now, and we did a piece of work for Westminster Council where um, we looked at how to get uh, council taxpayers to sign up to direct debit. It's better for the council. Arguably, it's better for the, the individual as well. <coughs> um, and uh, 
you know, in that process, we, we tested different, I think we were testing different leaflets and different communications and different strategies. And um, But we also tested against a control uh, in which we were using maybe the existing uh, leaflet that they'd, they'd used and a control cell in which we had no one being leafleted. And what we found was that there was no significant difference between the people who got the leaflets and the people who's, who didn't get any leaflet at all. And, um, and that's sort of devastating for you as a behavioural science practitioner because you like to think, oh, I've created these leaflets that are going to really influence people and want, get them to want to sign up for direct debit. But the, the circumstances didn't allow for that. What we learned was that Westminster Council shouldn't waste any money on leaflets. Uh, actually, the, the, the whole um, getting people to sign up to direct debit, there were other things that they could do in that process that weren't about consciously persuading people. Did the, um, did the pandemic... Uh like advance or accelerate the advancement of anything in behavioural science or, or, or provide an, an abundance of behavioural science data or mass, mm. which led to any breakthroughs or not? I don't think I've seen anything of it, but I mean, I'm not almost sure. certainly, yeah, because it was, must have been beneficial from a research perspective. Yeah, and there was a, there was a lot of research at the time about mask wearing. That was because there was you know, the whole behavioural science world was really looking at how do we get people to wear masks? How do we get people to wash their hands? These really interesting <coughs> behavioural challenges. I mean, I was, I was shocked. I was really shocked that it took the government six months to come up with hands, face, space, because I think the thing you would have done on day one in number 10, if I were there, would have been there would have been some mnemonic, some kind of uh, simple, um, very, very simple set of ideally rhyming, uh, you know, bits of language that could have conveyed to people what they should or shouldn't do. Um, and it was, it was well, I mean, it was into the August, September by the time that they actually launched uh, that piece of communication, which was which was pretty shocking. The other thing I found the most shocking was when the whole country was leafleted with a. Um, I th I've still got it somewhere. I've kept it as a as a signifier of what not to do. But uh, uh, there was a leaflet that went through everybody's door that showed them uh, if someone in your household gets sick, you know how long should you basically quarantine for? And what they did was show um, time passing within this leaflet, uh, from top to bottom. So instead of showing time progressing from left to right, so the man gets sick and then he's quarantining for a certain amount of time and then there was an overlap with next person kind of is contaminated or gets sick and, and then they have to uh, quarantine for a certain amount of time. And this was like the only piece of direct mail I think went to every household in the whole country and it showed time in the vertical, not uh, laterally, not across the page. And people don't make sense of time up and down. They make sense of it from left to right. Um, and I just couldn't believe that they had designed this leaflet so poorly that, I mean, it's, I just can't believe that anybody who had any basic understanding of human nature or comprehension uh, would have understood that that was a good leaflet. But the, the, the problem is that, you know, we're all using our very rational decision-making processes in business. And the great opportunity I have in the work that I do is to come into a business and go, oh yes, you've been treating your consumers like they're rational agents and they're not, bye-bye. Like they're, they're not at all. Um, they are actually human beings with all of these quirky, weird algorithms of the mind that have been that determined by evolution, um, m much more so than by, you know, the circumstances of the last few years. Um, and we try and sort of tap into that really basic understanding. But a lot of the time it's just kind of breaking through the kind of boardroom bullshit and, and the biases that we have in our own businesses that, you know, we, we, it's easy for us to talk about the rational stuff. It's much, much harder for people to talk about the things that just feel wrong um, because they can't quite put their finger on what it is that feels wrong. Um, and therefore it just goes unsaid. And so we get to, we get to say it, which is fun. Mm. The uh, the pandemic brought it, it 
to, to in my mind the term well the word nudge from mm. a from a marketing perspective behavioral science perspective got a got a stigma attached to it mm, after yeah. back in the pandemic because yeah. of the what was known as the nudge unit within the government yeah, yeah. and um I, I think you know i was thinking the same as you it's it got a bad rap but actually it's just it's completely not it's a completely normal part of any organization mm. trying to do anything and it's, it's a formal unit trying to work out how to influence people and, and achieve but they things. shouldn't be setting the ends they shouldn't be setting the goals that was the interesting thing is there should have been strategic leadership uh that determined this is the right end this is the right goal and then i would argue behavioral science can really lend itself to then okay how do we achieve that what is the right um what is the right path for doing that and and sadly a lot of the decisions that were made were, were not made based on really so the rigorous data. unit was creating the goals as well as the means to achieve them there was a lot of influence i think um from a number of behavioral scientists whether they were part of sage <laughs> at the time or um because it's gone it's private now isn't it that, yeah, that, it's, that group yeah, it's of people spun left. out. It's private, yeah, it? it's spun out. Um, I think it's I think it's partly state owned. I'm actually not sure, but oh, really? um, but certainly the, it, there are. It's it's definitely not entirely uh, government run anymore, um, as it used to be. Behavioral insights team they're called, but yeah, that's what everyone calls them. The, the nudge unit, and I don't think it was necessarily them, but there were other um, you know leading behavioral science kind of. Uh, uh, voices um, that were part of Sage and part of the teams that were developing like this the strategy, and um, I think that they were, you know, my understanding is that they were very, they were far too um, conservative, really, about what they thought people would would do in the pandemic. They didn't think that people would quarantine. They did. They thought there would be fatigue much earlier than there actually was. Um, and they sort of, they got it wrong, really. Um, they just, they just got it wrong based on their experience of um, human nature in a circumstance that was completely outside of the pandemic. Why do you think people were so cooperative with it for going on for so long? I think fear is a really powerful driver of behavior. And I think people were genuinely afraid. And then there was a, a huge amount of social pressure uh, that came along with that. Um, there's something in the behavioral sciences at the moment that they're talking about a kind of heterogeneity <coughs> revolution. And this is looking at the I idea that we're not, you know, we're not one species, <laughs> we are, but we're not one set of uh, behaviors. We as a species are very, very, <coughs> very varied. And that we should be using, instead of looking at kind of mean averages, for example, we really should be looking at kind of histograms and the way that we depict societal data means that we should be looking at the whole spectrum of uh, behavior, belief. Um, we do a lot of work around personality profiling, trying to understand different cohorts of people. We've done a lot of work in the United States around vaccine hesitancy and how to encourage people to take the vaccine. Um, and in that instance, you're not, you, you might pick one message that works on average better than the others for the largest group of people. But that doesn't mean to say that you're going to pick up everyone. And the way that you need to target the whole population to get everybody to sort of sign up might be very, very different. And we're, we're looking, we've done a lot of work, as I say, sort of profiling different audience groups, uh, different ethnicities, different uh, religious groups, trying to understand uh, their motivators. What is it that, what is the message that will influence them rather than just the best message overall? And I think there's, um, I think, I actually, one of the things that terrifies me is, um, and this com again comes down to having the right ends, is the opportunity for AI to now power um, mass micro communications that are really pushing your individual buttons um, rather than just one big mass campaign, like something that is very much targeted around what it knows about you and therefore what might best influence you. Um, and I want to be do using that same technology when it's for the right reasons, um, when it's for the things that we believe in. But um, I'm terrified of, of what Russia and, and the rest will be able to do, particularly come the next elections. 
Well, I assume it'll mean that that whoever's deploying it f from an influence perspective will be able to be, to your point, much more, their targeting get much more specific. Yeah. So at the moment, instead of targeting, you know, let's think, let's think you're a political party. Mm. Instead of targeting, I don't know, we're going to target Labour voters in the North mm. and try and convert them. So let's look at the Labour voters or who may, or which demographics might be, yes. blah, blah, blah. You can go even more granular than that because yeah. you've got that AI power to not, to yeah. one, be able to identify the targets and two, be able to, identify to work out message for them. the yeah. message for them and yeah. deploy the message and deploy yeah. the message. One of the things that, um, so I read Dom Cummings does an yes. article every month. Uh, I don't know if you've yes. read any of his stuff. And, Substack stuff. Yeah. Have you ever read any of his stuff? Some of it. I've okay. got a, uh, he's actually bizarrely the reason I'm here actually no way there's a Go very on. i mean there's a, i don't know how to to say this without sounding like a complete ass but um but basically <laughs> dominic spoke at the conference that i run uh in 2017 um and it was it was very it was a it was a it was a great presentation it was before the cambridge analytica stuff all came out and he was talking about how he used psychology and how he had this you know, team of physicists and, and data scientists uh, kind of crack <coughs> communications for um, for the uh, Leave campaign. Uh, and he actually said, in, you know, he was, he was in a room full of advertising people saying, look, ad, ad agencies, it's all snake oil. And these guys just come and try and tell you what the right thing is based on what they think. But actually, I had the data and I, I knew what. And so he was really doing much more of that specialist kind of targeting uh, way back then um, and yeah he spoke at our conference and then cut to 2020 and the pandemic is like in full swing and and I was looking at uh, my options at the time and they'd and he'd set up the 10 data science unit or he was trying to in government and um, which got dismissed by uh, yeah the um, Johnsons yeah at, uh, and I really believe in evidence-based government. I really, really believe that we should be doing things based on what's working in other countries and what is the evidence base and what does, yeah, what's the academic, like testing and learning and that that process, the science, I believe in scientific process as he does. And um, yeah, and he asked me to come into number 10. Uh, and I, I don't know him at all, but um, uh, I, I just knew him through my boss from and from hosting the conference and he I but I'd written an application for the 10 data science unit which he'd seen and then he asked me to come in and uh, and then he asked me uh, if I would consider being the prime minister's spokesperson <laughs> wow <laughs> which was without a doubt what probably the craziest day of my life I mean it was what in a the, compliment in the cabinet room of number 10 and but it gets weirder because in that meeting, uh, I thought, God, you know, I actually, I, I sort of agreed to go and work for him. I said no to being out in front of all the cameras and things. And I, I wasn't going to fall on Boris Johnson's sword anytime, but I did really, it was the pandemic. I thought maybe, you know, my country needs me, all that sort of stuff. People were dying because the communications were so bad. And, and, and I just thought, yeah, okay, I'll come and, uh, help out. And, um, and I, I was looking, I was going to go back in and have another um, meeting with them. But, and then he was out, of course. But, yeah. but when I was there in the room, um, I still can't believe I did this in some ways. Um, <laughs> I said to him, look, how much do you know about psychedelic medicine? And, and he said, go on, not much. Um, and we had quite a long conversation about psychedelic medicine in the cabinet room. Uh, because I said, because I, because I thought to myself, do you know what? This is ridiculous. This scenario that you're in right now is crazy, like in the heart of power. And you might never have this opportunity again. Who knows what can happen? Um, you, if, if nothing else, and he's probably going to dismiss this and think you're an absolute nut job, but at least you, you know, it, I just felt in my heart that I had to say it. And I really, really believe in evidence-based government. <clears throat> And I really, really believe that the next great age of mankind will be shaped by psychedelic medicine. Um, and, really? I, and I'm okay. so sad that everyone is so 
sad and depressed and apocalyptic about the future of the human race and our planet um, because I really do believe that we we desperately need to hope and and believe in a in a better future than than the one that we we currently sort of have presented to us and I I said to him look I know that you think that the uh that the next great innovation will be another sort of technological innovation I knew he looked to the US to DARPA to these organizations that have, had, had built these amazing technologies and that had shaped the world, the internet, these kinds of things. Um, and I, I said, but I tell you, the next great innovation is not gonna be something that you hold in your hand, like your phone. It's not gonna be like that. It's gonna be inside you and it's gonna shape the world as much as the pill and vaccination and all these other things, these amazing technologies, innovations that we don't hold in our hand and we forget all about because they're organic or they're within us, these kind of medical interventions that actually have had a dramatically profound impact on society. The pill alone has fundamentally changed everything about our world in some ways and liberated uh, women from from childbirth and from, you know, it's it, these very, very profound social changes, but they're not this kind of, yeah, they're, they're not just something that you, you see or you look at every day. Um, and and I said to him, and the thing about these, these uh, medicines, uh, psychedelic medicine, is that whilst we have all this data around things like mental health treatment and, um, <coughs> And yeah, and depression and anxiety and PTSD and addictions and all of these things. I said, the real impact is, is not just that, it's how this ripples out into just about every aspect of our world. Because we've got the, the cost of the healthcare service, not just for mental health, but also for lung cancer driven by tobacco addiction, for cirrhosis driven by alcohol addiction. We've got a domestic violence driven by people who are traumatized i would uh, i would strongly argue Theft, i think a third of all theft is driven by um drug addiction alone again you know, i've never met a drug addict who isn't a traumatized person you know there's a lot that we can do to to treat those addictions uh, as a as a mental health challenge and that if we can resolve them and if we do have a medicine that can begin to heal some of these individual problems <clears throat> the ripple effect outwards to wider society is is profound and it and it very much affects the the cost of everything how many police do we need on our streets if we've got a population who are just a hell of a lot happier um you know and we had a long conversation about it and afterwards um he connected me to some of the policy advisors in number 10 who were also interested in this area and then when he was gone and he he was sort of out of number 10 um and i wasn't i wasn't going to go and work for him anymore <laughs> fortunately ogilvy called me back up um when that happened i i thought well hang on I'm, the, the, the vote happened in oregon at the time um so everyone was talking about trump and biden and the big ref the big vote but there was a referendum in oregon vote 109 ballot 109 uh where they were looking at uh should we set up a statewide taxed kind of healthcare system dedicated to the use of psilocybin in Oregon and the ballot passed and this was huge news in the in the psychedelic community and so when that happened in November 2020 I, I emailed everybody who was on this email trail that that Dominic had put me on to and I think Manira Mirza was on there and all of the Boris's policy chief you know it's big names and I just sort of said hello here I am and I'm going to tell you about what's happening in Oregon have you paid attention and I tried to play a lot of ego cards around are we really going to let the Americans you know use all this amazing insight that's come from Imperial College London and you know and, and um you know I, I basically said are we doing anything about this and one of the policy advisors got back to me and I, I ended up chairing a meeting between number 10 and and Professor David Nutt and, and Dr. Robin Carter Harris, uh, who were at Imperial at the, at the time, Robin was at Imperial, um, who you know, are world leading experts on, um, on psilocybin and, and other psychedelic medicines. And the policy advisor I spoke to was a, a neuroscience grad, really <laughs> loved this. I just wanted to get the scientists in front of them uh, screw everything else like the, the chat is just, just understand what the science is saying 
And um, and through that process, I met Crispin Blunt, who was running the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group, and I ended up uh, working for them as a volunteer, sort of volunteer lobbyist, going up to party conference and printing materials and writing presentations and trying to get people to consider that psilocybin might be a very powerful medicine for us and that it needed, uh, the scientists needed more access to it. Um, so really, and, that, and that's brought me to running this campaign now, the PAR campaign for psilocybin access rights, but really it's all probably thanks to Dominic Cummings <laughs> and that one weird day of my life uh, where I sort of, kind of got offered a job that I didn't want, but it led to something entirely different and the universe had other plans for me. I did not see the DC tangent coming out. <laughs> so why, but that's a nice segue into um, into the psychedelics and psilocybin then. So why, why the focus from, on psilocybin from your end uh, as, and not so much on yes. other things like Good ayahuasca question. and... Yes. DMT and yeah, um, <laughs> amphetamines and well, amphetamines are different, but yeah, no, of course certainly, is different. So, yeah. yeah sorry, so, yeah. If, um, within the psychedelic world, there are there's a whole bunch of different uh, psychedelic medicines, of which yeah, ayahuasca. It, um, ayahuasca was actually my introduction to psychedelic medicine. Ayahuasca was the first psychedelic medicine that I ever accessed personally. Uh, so I have a gr great, great, very, very deep love uh, for ayahuasca. But um, why psilocybin is um, <clears throat> sounds like a medicine. <laughs> begins with a <laughs> begins with a P. Sounds like an S. Um, it sounds like a medicine. It is the psychoactive compound in magic mushrooms, which sound less like medicine, but also have uh, you know some positive um, connotations in that mushrooms are mushrooms. They grow out of the ground, and they <clears throat> are. Um, you know, uh, naturally found throughout throughout our country. This is a native um, uh, compound, uh, and it grows wild every autumn. Um, so there's a uh, that that was a very that was part of it. Um, primarily, I think we we wanted to look at psilocybin because it had the most research. So we we being who? we being uh, well, the Conservative Drug Policy Reform Group. Um, which is not a conservative affiliated organization, but Crispin Blunt is a conservative MP. He's set it up. Uh, we have other MPs uh, who are part of the group um, from the Labour benches, from the Greens, from the how SNP. Was, how was he able to... He, I was able to include, include conservative in the name of his not conservative affiliate. Yeah, they can't, well, you can't be popular. The, par the party don't like that at all. No, no they really say. don't. But um, it's uh, it's not conservative affiliated. It's basically, I, I, I say to people, it's a bit like saying we're not calling ourselves the progressive <clears throat> radical drug policy reform group. We are, it is small C, we're not asking for very much in terms of, we're asking for the, for the government to follow um, the evidence base. Okay. Now it's very possible that there might be a rebrand on the horizon considering the change of government, for example. It wouldn't be expedient to be called the Conservative Drug Policy I assumed Reform it was party affiliated. I didn't no, realise yeah. it was a small C. Okay. No, and actually, so Charlotte Nichols um, is a Labour MP who's been really, really vocal advocate. Um, she spoke so eloquently at the backbench business debate uh, in May that the, the CDPRG um, you know, helped kind of facilitate um and yeah so we've got a lot of labor members and and yeah the naming the naming is probably falling out of step now uh, with what we need um but yeah it was the it was the cdprg that um that i kind of joined and then we spun par out of that and par, par the campaign for psilocybin access rights psilocybin beginning with a p but sounding like an s which uh, it was again and it was a conscious decision to give ourselves like a little uh, moniker a name that meant that people didn't actually have to say the word psilocybin even when they're, when they're talking about us because it's really awkward and even if you know how to say it people say it differently on different sides of the atlantic psilocybin psilocybin there's no really right or wrong way uh, but it's definitely a barrier the, the the reason for psilocybin, there is more evidence. There is uh, more evidence uh, available to us, more modern evidence than pretty much, than, than any other psychedelic on the table. Um, so the wealth of evidence for psilocybin specifically is really high. 
MDMA, which is not strictly a classic psychedelic, um, but there are there is a wealth of data available, particularly in the United States, and an organisation called MAPS who are a spearheading and and will they will get FDA approval for MDMA before psilocybin. But certainly in this country, uh, there is a wealth of data around psilocybin and it has, versus something like LSD, by far the best clinical um, opportunity in that a, a dosing experience, a macro dose, a high dose psilocybin experience of the kind that you get in the clinical trials lasts between four and six hours reliably, absolutely reliably so. My understanding is that it wouldn't even matter how much psilocybin I gave you, even if I gave you a huge amount of psilocybin, it would still metabolize out of your body within that time frame. Now, the difference with something like LSD is that, um, as I understand it, the molecule is a lot sort of stickier. It, it really attaches very tightly um, to those the <coughs> neurotransmitters in the brain, if that's the right phrasing. And whereas psilocybin will metabolize away within that four to six hour time period, LSD will st stick a bit tighter. And therefore it might take nine hours, 12 hours, 24 hours. And the more that you put into the system, the more likely you are to have some rogue elements that really won't metabolize out for really significant amounts of time. And that means that in, in the clinical studies, it's just not as practicable. That said, I do believe that f treatment for alcoholism in the future, my personal belief is that alcoholism and um, some other ad addictions uh, to psychoactive substances, um, that the LSD might end up being the, the preferred treatment. It might end up being more effective. Um, I don't think we have that data yet, but certainly you know, when they first started using LSD to treat alcoholism back in the 1950s, um, it, you know, it was, it was, you know, really very effective. I think something like 40% of, um, uh, of uh, participants in the clinical trials back in the 50s actually uh, quit drinking or significantly reduced their alcohol uh, intake um, following treatment with LSD. And I mean, you might think forty percent is not that high. Forty percent is astonishing. Huge. I think I think AA get somewhere somewhere under under ten percent certainly. Yeah. I mean, that the, the in terms of the potential treatment, the benefits of of you know, psilocybin and other psychedelics to treat ill health, should we say, or ailments? Mm -hmm. I'm almost more excited by the the prospect of treating the addictions mm -hmm. than the mental mental health aspects I think they all of, go together you can't you can't tie them really no no I know you can't <laughs> but, I know, but I know you can't but I, I feel like the addictions are more identifiable oh yeah they're easy to spot they're so you can go bang and, and treat that and then quite often that'll reduce in my non-experienced professional will reduce the likelihood mm. of um, a worsening mental health situation whatever it may be whatever it may be uh, or or the advent of one if it hasn't occurred already um, but but coming back a sec what led you to your, your first psychedelic experience then which was a very ayahuasca, brief period if you don't mind me asking yeah a very brief period of depression i say that because i was really <coughs> lucky you know i'd always been a very very jolly person and it wasn't until i got to that kind of classic i think i was about 29 30 and I think in your late twenties, early thirties, that's when people start to recognize patterns in their life and they start, there's a discontent, um, that can set in. And in, in my own case, I, I <coughs> left, uh, a, a boyfriend, uh, I, I left him and it was, that was the trigger for me to actually deal with, uh, feelings that I had not visited. Uh, since I was a child about when my, uh, you know, my, my own, um, my, my mother had kind of sort of like, uh, what's the right word? It sort of kidnapped us, me and my sisters. And, um, she, she, she'd gone through a breakdown. She'd had a breakdown when I was a child. And so she'd taken us away. Uh, and I didn't know this as a child. I thought my dad was in America. Um, cause he used to go to America quite frequently. And then I basically found out that, uh, he hadn't been in America, he'd been in our house and we'd, we'd been off somewhere else. And I, as a sort of seven-year-old child, I blamed myself for abandoning my father, which is utterly ridiculous. 
But I now understand, you know, what happened to me in that period and how I felt, you know, that I should have been there somehow, that I should, I left him alone. And then in this, when I was- but You didn't of, know he was there, right? No, I didn't know he was there. Did your mother, was my, no, your mother Yeah, my mother him. had yeah. taken us away and, and we didn't know that he was at home. And I didn't sort of question it, you know, I was a child. Um, and yeah, and this feeling that I had somehow abandoned him and left him alone, uh in our in our house not knowing where we were was absolutely devastating for me and i mean i i couldn't even talk about that my entire you know young adult life without probably wanting to cry it was a, it was a massively traumatic experience Fortunately, my sisters didn't didn't seem to be as traumatized as I was. But this is the thing about being the eldest and sort of knowing a bit more about what's going on. And um, and it wasn't until I was sort of twenty nine, thirty that leaving uh, my ex boyfriend triggered in me this depression. Um, and I basically felt like the world's worst person. I felt so incredibly guilty. I, I still felt guilty from leaving my my ex-boyfriend before that. I'd had another boyfriend before that. I'd left him. And there was this crushing amount of guilt. And it was linked back to... And ultimately, it was all know. linked back to, wow. you know, these sort of uh, <clears throat> very early experiences of the world and these early patterns of thought. And, um, and fortunately for me, in my ayahuasca experience, I was able to learn that really all that was really going on was that my ego wanted me to be a good person. And if you, if you sort of leave someone and you, and you hurt them in some way, or you abandon them, this kind of grand language, actually all it really was, was my ego being very self-important. And, um, and I wanted to, I, I was feeling this guilt and this depression really because I wanted to be a good person. And if you hurt someone, you should feel bad about it, right? But that thought had got so out of control that it was sort of not killing me, but it was really, it robbed the joy from my life. I didn't feel that I ought to be happy because I'd hurt this, these other people um, by withdrawing myself. And the ayahuasca told me, I am a good person. I don't have to prove it to anyone. How did you, how did that lesson present itself? You, in my experience, I, I don't actually have very visual, um, people always talk about psychedelics as hallucinatory. Not everybody hallucinates, not all the time. I have very, very physical experiences. <clears throat> and um, in my case, I talked to myself and I told myself what was going on and the words were coming out of my, my mouth and I was listening to them. And so- um, You were actually talking, it wasn't I was actually head. talking, yeah. but it, if, uh, for me, the ayahuasca experience allowed me to separate um, my ego and the person called Tara Austin and her life story from my what Eckhart Tolle calls my your being um, and my my connectivity to the whole universe in, and um, my 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 body, if you like, was sort of representing that side of things, and my body was telling me what I needed to hear. And I said the words out loud that I needed to hear um, that, you know, that actually, yeah, I was, I was a good person. I didn't need to feel guilty about any of this stuff because I didn't try and hurt anyone. And uh, it wasn't, none of it was my kind of fault. Um, and, and importantly, that all these other people that, you know, I'd, I'd left, they were on their own journey. They had their own life to live. And um, all I was really trying to do was, uh, somehow manage them or deny their feelings, take responsibility for their feelings. Well, it wasn't mine to take. They're, they're on their own journey. Again, it's sort of self-important, weird ego stuff that when my ego had quietened down, I'd realized, uh, yeah, that it really wasn't about me. And I, I just, uh, all I needed to do was bring as much joy as possible into the world, um, my own and other people's, and um, I didn't have anything to apologize for or feel guilty about or feel depressed about. In fact, the universe was the most wonderful gift. Uh, life was the most amazing gift. And I was able to see that clearly when I'd kind of put, yeah, put my ego mind down and the story I was telling myself about uh, who I was and what I'd done by leaving these, uh, these men um, really all just tracked back to some 
very distorted view of of reality that stemmed from childhood and you know and since then i've been able to see that same that same story play out in the um the hundreds of people that i've seen that have gone through psychedelic experiences uh invariably in the state discover that something that they had uh, thought or felt um at a very very early age uh, was actually not really true or maladaptive or not quite, quite helpful. Um, I sometimes describe it to people as like, even, even people who are living with sort of really, uh, you know, potentially sort of relatively happy, maybe not happy lives, but, uh, you know, they might not even consider themselves to be sort of depressed, for example. Um, but I, I think of it a little bit like if you if your house is beautiful, but it stinks. You're not going to bring people over, or if you do, it's not it's not the experience anyone wants. Um, and I think by around late twenties, thirties, that's when you start to realise, oh, hang on a minute, my house stinks, <laughs> and it's all because there's something in the basement, and it's locked away down there. And psychedelics, I mean, there's lots of different ways you can go and clean that basement. But psychedelics will give you the key to the door. Like they will allow you to unlock the door and it's dark and it can be quite frightening and scary. And you need somebody, a, a guide, a, a trip sitter, as they describe it, um, who will stand at the top of the staircase and keep the door open and, and tell you, you can do this and reassure you as you go down into that basement and you go, okay, what's down here? What is it that's in my house? What is it that's in my own mind? What associations, what concepts, what thinking, what experiences are in here that are actually causing me problems now? And invariably, if you've got that right set and setting, as we talk about in psychedelic therapy, you know, you've got somebody there with you uh, who can help guide that experience and, and make you feel completely trusting and that you can do this you can go down into the basement and you can find that crappy old thing that is stinking out of the place and you can switch the light on and 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 really there is an illumination that that allows your own psychology to come into perspective and give you that perspective and then you can throw out the junk and there is the most extraordinary liberation uh, for a lot of people now everybody is completely different there is no silver bullet um, you that's, know, all of those uh, things. Uh, but and that's, on the that's on the assumption that someone is going to go for a psychedelic experience to try and fix something. Yeah. Whereas with my few experiences, I was just doing it because I, I hadn't ever. And um, yeah, probably the main reason. I hadn't ever. And maybe I was looking for something, but it wasn't any specific. And I certainly made sure because I, I, I was doing it a bit amateur hour. I had no trip sitter yeah, or yeah, shark yeah, watch as I yeah. prefer to it and nothing like that. Um, but each one, I got something from it. Yeah. Uh, Self-knowledge. So Self-knowledge. Well, no, as in there was, I fixed things okay, yeah, in it. Yeah. And it, it's interesting you, you describe it because I, as, as you know, it's super, it's so difficult to describe to, yeah. especially to people who haven't ever, Yeah, you know, it's like, and it, it can sound so ridiculous. And it can sound so abstract, yes. so airy fairy, and, and and but that's kind of the only way to describe it because you're mm -hmm. still trying to work out the way uh, out yourself. The way I try, the way I sort of try and understand what it does and why it does it, it being the experience and why it's able to present to you an alternative perspective. That's yeah. the way I it, it putting you. You know, Plato said, "Give me a place to stand. I'll move the earth. I'll I'll, yeah. move, I'll move the earth." It's like it puts it puts it puts your consciousness on a different planet. You're looking at your, your life, which is the planet, and you're able to shift it because you've seen you've seen the life from a different perspective. But Rick Doblin says this. He, oh, really? the, the guy from Maps. He he literally says, you know, that the astronauts who've been out to the moon mm. and that, that, that they look back on Earth. There's something called the overview effect when they see the yeah. whole Earth. That, that and that picture of the Earth was actually when they first found, like they first took that photograph of the blue planet it was very profound for people very very moving but you know the astronauts that come back from space where they've seen all of life on this one orb 
they have a new perspective and they typically, you know, a lot of them have got very, very involved with um, the fight against climate change, things like that. And Rick, Rick says, look, it's a lot cheaper <laughs> than sending people off in rockets is giving them these psychedelic medicines that can take them off planet, that can give them that same perspective, that can give them the overview effect. I think it's true. So I, yeah, I mean, I tend to feel at the mo like these days with the, I say these days, as we've evolved and this like, this information bombardment and this, oh, what's the word? You know, sensory overload that everyone's uh, bombarded with. I think it's like, it adds a layer of complexity to, well, it just makes it extremely complicated to try and understand yourself and understand your feelings and, and why you think things. I think one of the things that the psychedelic experience does, in my in my experience anyway, is it strips away all, it takes away all that complexity and, and the only thing that matter in that experience is the baseline things. What is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong, what matters, what does not. And all the other rubbish is gone. Because mm. it, it's hard when we try and work out why it's why it sort of presents. You know, you talk about experiences you know, like this, it gives you the answer, mm. you know. In, in, in it's, insight. I think there's a huge it? amount of insight. Yeah, and the, the wonderful thing is that insight, yeah. all of that yeah. insight comes from you, right? There's nobody mm. interpreting. There's nobody telling you. And of course, in the period afterwards, you can interpret and you can, you know, this integration period, I think is really important that we often talk about. And yeah, you can work with a therapist on, on all of that, but really all of it's coming from you. You are the um, teacher, you are the therapist. Um, um, my, my mother described trip sitting as psychedelic midwifery, which I really actually love as a, as a, <laughs> term because um again it's like it, it's it's the the birth you know the, the the trip sitter the guide the therapist isn't the one doing the work they're really not very important except that they are critical to helping the person who is that journeyer seeker um experiencer helping them feel as uh trusting and as relaxed and as um you know and as and as empowered as possible just like a great midwife or doula or whatever would do for someone who's going through the birth experience i think there's a lot of commonality um it's this it's it can be traumatic it can be difficult it can be challenging there will be tears there might be there's a lot of emotional pain um typically in a, in a lot of journeys and experiences but you come out of the other side of that with joy and the, and the resulting um, you know, the result of that re that rebirth um, is the greatest amount of, of joy, I think. Um, and certainly that's been my experience. How does it, how does it work then? Let's go back on, onto the, the science side. So how does it work, well, it's not even the science side, with the addictions? Mm. How, what is the research showing with its ability to reduce people's addiction to something? Well, and there's something is really interesting because we're seeing uh, across the board that it's it's not it's whereas historically the therapists and the psychologists have categorized and pathologized different conditions into different boxes. I can't remember. There's a document I think it's called the DSM, the Diagnostic Manual. Uh, that you know talks about these different conditions that exist anxiety ptsd alcoholism gambling addictions anorexia all separate uh, um, issues and yet what we're starting to see is that psychedelics can treat all of these issues whether they are um, whether they might be what you would think of as a very much um, a physiological addiction to nicotine and smoking or alcohol but equally a, a, a behavioral addiction to gambling. That's some of the latest work that's, that's happening right now around gambling addiction. Anorexia, OCD, these different conditions that historically have been kept apart in different boxes. S psychedelic medicine is breaking down those, um, those walls between them and, and suggesting that the same mechanisms of mind are involved in all of these instances, that the same maladaptive pattern of thought uh, is at play and that by disrupting that pattern of thought and introducing maybe some neuroplasticity as well that we can rewrite that that programming i the analogy i always use with people is if if you were going down the mountain and skis and you were in a rut that rut could be 
I want to fag, I want to fag, I want to fag. I want to, I want to drink, I want to drink. It might be, uh, I want to, I want to gamble, or I mustn't eat anything, or I'm no good. Um, and actually, the really interesting thing about something like depression is that the mind is an amazing confirmation machine. So, the more <clears throat> depressed you are, the more likely you are to recognize in the world around you uh, the the things that should should make that depression even worse. Like somebody looks at you funny in the shop and because you're depressed, that means that they know that you're no good as a person. Uh, everything becomes very sticky and, and it's almost like the, the, the fact that the rut exists at all means that it can deepen and deepen and deepen and the brain just reconfirms and strengthens the association uh, and and maybe even the strengthens that behavior because you're doing it all the time it becomes more habitual it becomes habitual in your thinking deeper 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 rut that you can't get out of and the and the difficult thing with a lot of um psychological conditions is that people who are happy and joyful can't understand why people other people are, are doing these behaviors why are they are thinking these ways you know because they're not stuck in that pattern of thought and for me what psilocybin represents and the other psychedelics is a fresh layer of snow and you can still choose to ski down the mountain in that same way if you want to but the power uh the liberation the freedom to say hey actually that really doesn't serve me and i don't want to go down that path anymore i'm gonna i'm gonna ski over here on this beautiful bit of land um there there is this space this mental space this mental power that comes, I think, from really deep uh, insight during the psychedelic state and the, potentially the neuroplasticity. So I think in terms of the, the science piece, there is, they talk about psychedelics as knocking out the default mode network. That is, what, it's probably the leading theory as to why they work at the moment. And the default mode network is arguably the ego mind, to go back to Eckhart Tolle and the way he talks about it, is the ego mind. It's the story of you. It's your story. It's the. It's it's also the part of the kind of resting brain state of when I'm not really thinking about anything at all. It's the system of the brain that's kind of in charge. It's me. And what psychedelics do is disrupt that. They cause the whole brain to connect in ways that it, it, there's a huge amount of disorder um, and parts of the brain that are not normally connected at all suddenly are connecting. So hence why you, you're hallucinating. Parts of the brain that, um, you know, your, your visual cortexes, if that's not the right language, but the, the visual aspects of the brain are connecting suddenly. They might even connect to the parts of the brain that deal with taste. You might be able to taste a color. You might be able to see a sound. Synesthesia is really, really common in these experiences. So the parts of the brain that are all connecting, connecting, connecting. And there's a great visualization that Robin Carhart Harris developed in the team at Imperial that shows kind of the resting brain state and the number of connections of different areas of the brain during that resting brain state versus the brain on psilocybin. And the brain on psilocybin is just, ah, everything's connecting. Um, they sometimes describe it as a bit like instead of the uh, the uh, orchestra, the the guy who's what's the, name, the conductor of the orchestra, he's been knocked out, and the whole orchestra is just playing, and they're all playing their own little tune, and it's and there's a, there's chaos there, but there's also connection and maybe a kind of like a resetting of. Uh, a new order in the brain. Again, like I, th I think of it as the shaking the snow globe, putting in a, a new layer of snow, getting out of the rut, the, the obsessive pattern of thought that has become maladaptive and switching that off and on again. There's so many different anal analogies that we can use. They're all just analogies for how we as human beings experience our own thought patterns and our own behavior. And that disorder combined with potentially the opportunity for new growth and new pathways to form in the brain, which is the neuroplasticity that they're exploring right now. And there's still a lot to study. There's some amazing rat studies that show that the dendrites of the neurons are sustained in growth for at least six months after a high dose psilocybin experience, which is amazing. And like the potential for more research around that is just in terms of neural degeneration and, and Alzheimer's and all those kinds of things, I think is really, really exciting and something we should be exploring a lot further. But that injection of, of new 
possibilities, new thinking, new pathways into the brain. That's what powers the the opportunity, the catalyst that people have when they have a high dose experience to then fundamentally change their thinking, change their lives. I think they're changing the mechanisms of their mind. I assume with a with a treatment addiction, where there's a chemical dependency like alcoholism or I don't know smoking or something more serious like a you know uh, some uh, some drug, uh, cocaine. Heroin, heroin. Um, I assume that in th this, like a, a treatment program based around LSD or psilocybin for a, as I say, it's alcohol addiction, that would have to come hand in hand with a, you know, something to treat the physiological side of it, get over the chemical dependency or not. Yeah. What's the, what, the, what would a program look like, like a treatment program somewhere? In fact, where's doing something like this now? I mean, they, they are developing these things all over the world, in, in the US. Switzerland, Spain, you know, there's studies happening absolutely everywhere now. And there are treatment programs that are being developed in jurisdictions like Jamaica and, and you know, the Netherlands and Portugal, places <coughs> where there's there's either decriminalization or where, you know, in Oregon, like I said, they've they've set up a, a, a taxed healthcare system that is dedicated to use of psilocybin. There are, there are other states in America, Colorado, San Francisco is probably going to come along, but, but uh, Oregon is by far the most advanced. Australia and um, Australia recently rescheduled psilocybin. Um, and this is really important. So, I heard this in one of your previous interviews, actually. Yeah, yeah. So, go on to so, so one thing I should say is that there's a big difference between the scheduling of a drug and its classification. So the class of drug relates to whether or not you or I are allowed to possess it, whether we can sell it to other people, um, and how long we'll get in prison if we do so. <clears throat> uh, the police can take uh, substances off us um, if they are class sort of A, B, C, um, and there's different sentencing times associated with those different, uh, those different drugs. Um, but the scheduling is different. The scheduling relates to whether or not a, a licensed medical professional or a licensed regulated person in a sort of professional capacity <clears throat> whether they are allowed to uh, access or give somebody else the substance so uh, morphine for example heroin is a class a drug but it is a schedule two substance uh, that is because every hospital pharmacy in the country contains morphine it is a medicine and if you have break your back you're going to need it and doctors who are regulated and, and nurses and people who've got licenses to treat others are allowed to access that, that molecule, that medicine. The problem we have is that psilocybin is not only a class A drug, uh, you're not allowed to use it, pick it, give it to anyone else, 14 years in prison for, for distributing this this element that grows naturally throughout our country and in our fields. This, this thing that's in a mushroom on the fields, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Professor Nutt, I think is, uh, he, he, he's, I think I've heard him say, if you if you pick it, that's when it becomes illegal. If you bend down on the ground on all fours and eat it straight out of the ground, there's nothing that they can do. But um, <laughs> as in, there's no, there's no illegal action that has been performed as far as I understand. Um, but yeah, with the problem we've got is that psilocybin is in schedule one. Now a schedule one substance is meant to be a substance that has no known medical benefit uh, and a high potential for abuse. Now, <clears throat> neither of those things are true. They are categorically not true of psilocybin. And the rest of the world is starting to recognise this. Uh, we've got these old, the, 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 old, um, the old world, like Australia, Canada, America, uh, all English-speaking um, Western uh, states, they've they've all recognized they're all recognizing that um psilocybin uh has huge 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 medical uh potential to heal people um interestingly in oregon the system that they've set up is not just for uh purely therapeutic use so when <clears throat> i was saying earlier like you know uh, this medicine can help you go down into the basement and, 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 and see what's stinking in there. What's really interesting is that a lot of people who are, like you described, who may be uh, intrigued about their own psyche, are 
you know, just normal people, healthy normals, we'd call them in, in the studies, um, that what they're doing in, in Oregon, they are allowed, anyone over the age of 21 is allowed to say, I want to go and experience this medicine. No way. Yeah. And, and provided they're willing to, to pay. And there's a lot of, a lot of problems with the system that they set up over there. But, um, Why you is know, that? well, for one thing, I mean, it's, you know, it's America, you have to pay for everything. Um, and they, they've, <laughs> Uh, the way that they've uh, set it up means that a lot of the um, the centres uh, are yeah are not very accessible. There's huge wait lists as well on some, for some of this stuff, um, but th there's been a there's been a lot of problems around where they can actually uh, what premises they're allowed to use, and it's all based around uh, doing it in certain premises. So you couldn't, for example, have a uh, a shaman or a, a, a guide, a trip sitter who would come to your house, for example, and do this, that would not be possible in Oregon. It's all, uh, and there are very few areas, as I understand it, in Oregon where the local, if you like, the kind of local council will allow a retreat center to be established. There are a lot of regulations about where the retreat centers can be. And there's, there's problems, it, it's, there's bound to be teething problems. But interestingly, Australia has rescheduled psilocybin and MDMA, but, in that instance, there hasn't been a single prescription. As my, I understand it, there's been no prescription yet. And the reason for that is that they might have rescheduled it, but they haven't actually put in place the legislative system uh, and the, the model for access. One of the things that we are doing now as the PAR campaign, and we, we just got back, we had a big um, uh, session this last, uh, this weekend just gone, uh, where we got Charlotte Nichols MP down to a, a place called Medicine Festival, which is just outside Reading. Amazing, amazing uh, festival. Uh, totally sober, sober festival. No, no booze. Um, uh, amazing event, and we uh, we held a kind of uh, workshop, if you like, around what should the the model of access look like in the future for psilocybin. Because for one thing, you know, it is an interesting subject substance in that people can use it at um, these high dose levels, which is what I always talk about because that's where the, the clinical data is. Nonetheless, lots and lots and lots and lots of people you will talk to will tell you that they are using it at a micro level. That they I've are used microdosing. it at a micro level, yeah. yeah Obviously which, not over here because that would be illegal. It would be totally illegal to do that in the UK. Yeah. Um, and so one, you know, one of the, we, we, as a, as an activist group right now, we are totally focused on the rescheduling of psilocybin. Now that means bringing the scheduling down from one to two so that medical professionals can access it in the same way that they access morphine and heroin, uh, morphine and, uh, and other, um, drugs, uh, the ca cannabis that uh, is actually medically available, uh, in the UK. We need psilocybin to be in that same status, but what that won't change, and we're very conscious of that, is that won't change the classification. That won't change how long you could get uh, locked up in prison for using these substances or having them in your home or giving them to anyone else. So, you know, when that rescheduling does happen, there are going to be there are going to be more challenges that will arise around access to psilocybin, which is why we call the the campaign for psilocybin access rights because we do believe that this is a a civil rights movement that this is the next you know, it's the next wave of, of the civil rights movement. We have, we should have uh, the right to access our own consciousness in the way that we choose. One of the most interesting things that's happened in the rest of the world is uh, in Canada, where the Canadians uh, effectively have, and have had for a very long time now, the right to die. So they have a, a program for euthanasia. And this has been used by the psychedelic um, uh, uh, gang, if you like, to uh, argue if and the, the line they've used is right to die right to try can you really tell me if i'm you know if i'm uh, you can tell me i'm i can kill myself uh, and that would be sponsored by the state but i cannot take this naturally grown uh, medicine and mm. explore my own consciousness and for people who are dying of terminal illness in particular um, that's that's monstrous, right. and the Canadians have got a long way by encourage by by making that very strong argument. And there are people who are who there's an amazing man, Thomas Mark Hartle, um, who has been suffering from a, a terminal, I think, it's bowel cancer for many years now. Um, but initially, he was given only a, a couple of months to live, uh, and he applied um, to to be able to try psilocybin to relieve his end of life distress, which 
it was very successful in doing and he's become a really big advocate for the movement over there but you know it's it is utterly monstrous that we would deny dying people access to well, the, this the crazy thing about canada is that not only are they are giving people the right to die they're actively offering it offering it yeah. i don't know if you've seen any of these cases but they're offering it not even where terminal illness is concerned where yeah. people are unhappy yeah. Yeah. because if you're, they can't if you're afford depressed. housing, depressed, yeah. and they're offering it. it, it beggars it's, belief. But yeah, we, and you're depressed, and yet they what it, you it, they, it they'll let you die, madness. but they won't let you it's try madness. this molecule that might save your life, that madness. might that might give you your joy back. And that is that is the the absolute madness of this situation that we're in. We, uh, and that's why it is a civil rights movement. It's like it should be my right to to allow myself to heal my own psyche. We've got about. We have got, I say about, we've got 10 minutes left. Like, I, know, I know you've got a hard <laughs> Sorry, start, but, but before talk. we go on to that, I, when you talk about Oregon and and, it, and, and a psilocybin experience being being available, you know, as difficult, in all the difficult circumstances, available to everyone or anyone who wants it in Oregon. If they can afford it. If they can afford it, right? <laughs> and, and, I, and that is... I, and I they like, can find I, a retreat centre like with enough space. I like, I like there needs to be control measures, right? But can you imagine how different... For the good the uk would be overnight overnight if everyone if everyone right who is sound in mind or wanted to was able to have some form of psychedelic experience as a psilocybin tomorrow you'd be walking into a different world i, I truly believe it you'd be walking in a different world rick purely doblin because of it. the insight That's the it. insight you get rick doblin says that he believes i think it's like 2050 or something he says he thinks we will have a spiritualized humanity. Yeah. And there are many people now also looking at the potential for psychedelics to re give, rebalance our relationship with nature and give us perspective that will allow us to correct the climate problem uh, in a really powerful and meaningful way. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things in the psychedelic movement is that there are a lot of people who talk about the hype and the shroom boom and all of this you know don't hype the medicine um and they get sort of protective about that and i uh, and, and people will will use the word utopian as if it's a bad thing uh to be a utopian i am absolutely a utopian if a utopian means i think that the, the world of tomorrow will be better than the world of today and it will be that way if we make this effort and we allow safe access to this medicine we've got to steward this medicine through it is they are powerful they are dangerous in the wrong hands they are um they can traumatize people i do i do not take any uh, i do not take it lightly if uh, that's why i do the work that i do because anybody out there anybody listening to this who is taking ssri antidepressants can read robin carhart harris's paper on uh escitalopram the leading ssri versus psilocybin you can read that it's publicly available and i'd be very surprised if at the end of that you still want to be continuing taking these ssris that have very very profound impacts on people's lives um that have a whole raft of um of uh, problems from things like even things like loss of libido which nobody takes seriously but has a, a massively detrimental effect not just to you but to the person you might have as a partner like again these ripple effects are so vast uh, from these medicines and uh, anybody can read that report anybody can read that research and anybody can go out there and pick these mushrooms or access them on the black market and they can do that in a way that would be very detrimental to them, um, that might be dangerous to them. Uh, not physiologically dangerous, but psychologically, uh, these medicines can absolutely <coughs> cause harm if they're not dealt with properly. And the reason that we spend all our time and energy as a, as a campaign group lobbying the government uh, to make change and to recognize these medicines is that we want them to get ahead of it. We, we don't want people doing desperate things in desperate circumstances. We lose something like 18 people every single day on average to suicide in this country. And we shouldn't be. They, you know, people, I, I believe people die because they give up hope and that these medicines absolutely, even if they, for whatever reason, they, they were not right for you. I do believe that they represent hope for millions of people and that that hope alone can keep them alive. But I, I believe that they should be given the opportunity to, to try this if, that, if that's what they seek to do. And they should be able to give that opportunity in safe circumstances, ideally in the kind of circumstances that we do see in the clinical trials where you have got 
somebody with you, somebody experienced guiding your experience, or at least guiding is probably not the right word, but at least present with you during that experience and reassuring you and allowing that experience to be as healing as it possibly could be. We've got, it's got to be safe. It's got to be regulated. That's why I don't believe in just widespread decriminalization right here and now. I want the rescheduling. I want the medical access. And then we'll have to talk about everything else that follows from that. Um, but, you know, the more people that go through this treat these treatments, the more our humanity, our, our society is going to wake up to what the potential is. And I, I really do believe it, it is that spiritualized humanity. And it is... Yeah, it's the it's the thing that gives me hope for the future. What's next on the step for the campaign? What's what's the next target? What are you trying to achieve in the short term? Yeah, so um, we've just got back from this festival where we've 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 persuaded five hundred people to sign uh, postcards, letters to their MPs that we're are posting. They sober? Yeah, they were all sober. Every <laughs> single one of them was sober, um, and uh, so we you know we're continuing to to do. Th that work and the, and the kind of lobbying work on the more public side though we've got a we've got an event we're running for magic mushroom day in uh, september 20th of september where's that, um, Where that? we're going to be held we're ho holding an art auction we haven't actually launched the tickets yet this is uh, first time i'm talking about it but we're holding an art auction in soho um, and the aim is to raise money for what we are calling project croydon which does sound like something from Only Fools and Horses, <laughs> um, which I think is the appeal because, um, yeah, we're a bunch of silly gang, really. But uh, Project Croydon is our attempt at uh, hustling Chris Philp. Chris Philp is the Home Office Minister who is personally responsible for the rescheduling of psilocybin. All he needs to do is sign a statutory instrument that uh, Crispin Blunt and Charlotte uh, Nichols MP and, and Jeff Smith and the other MPs that we work with uh, at the CDPRG, that they have written this thing. He just needs to sign it. Now- This is the point of schedule two, right? Just to bring it into schedule two, yeah. Um, it can happen very easily. Uh, he, uh, and what we are asking him to do is review the evidence, do their flipping jobs at the Home Office, rather than kicking the can down the road and sort of suggesting, oh, well, maybe we'll wait for the FDA in America to, to, to approve this. That's not good enough. I thought we took back control. <laughs> like, uh, not, not, that I, not that I was voting for that, but, um, you know, the, 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 we, it, is, it is astonishing that, that the Home Office is just acting like this isn't really happening, although they also at the same time seem to know that this is coming because it will come in America anyway. So what's um, stopping him right now then? Suella Braverman probably, um, and inertia. It, this, the stigma has dramatically decreased in the last year. Why, why Suella? What, why? Uh, there's a perception amongst some very, very, very out of touch conservative MPs like Suella, um, who has no idea what the majority of the country think. Uh, there's this perception that uh, they need to be tough on drugs and w without really understanding what anything about what psych psychedelic medicines represent for our country in terms of potential, the great majority of the British public and the majority of conservative voters too believe that psilocybin should be rescheduled. It's a, a straightforward. The data points are all there. So no and it, in, it, increase, it increases when you tell them uh, hey, this is already happening in, in Canada. We haven't even done the research yet that says, hey, this has already happened in Australia, but you can you can bet your bottom dollar that's going to increase it even further. More than sort of, like around 70% of people believe this should be rescheduled. It is a no-brainer. I mean, my, the, there is nothing to stand in the way of the rescheduling other than people who don't understand science and, and who are not interested in science. And unfortunately, that is this, the case with our Home Secretary at the moment. Uh, she's standing in the way of progress. She's standing in the way of science. And what we need is Chris Philp to really own this. Um, we want to put more pressure on him personally. We want to make it an election issue for him in South Croydon. That is his constituency. And so we've decided that we want to put some effort into on the ground kind of activism rather than just talking about this stuff. We're going to go and hit the streets of South Croydon with leaflets. Uh, we're hoping to get some poster sites, putting things through people's what letterboxes. What day is this, 21st September? No, uh, we're not going to be doing it then. We're ra raising some money then. Oh. And the, the chances are that we will probably 
activate in February next year. So there's plenty of time to kind of get involved. And, you know, we need as many literal foot soldiers as we can get. Um, we really want to make some noise in, in, in South Croydon, some noise that the London media, maybe even the national media will pay attention to, because it's a bit of a weird thing to do. But we like to think if we can make the residents, the constituents of South Croydon, the most informed people in the country as to why, you know, psilocybin holds this promise and, and tell them that it is their minister that is holding this back that we might get you know I, I like the idea of uh, some BBC vox pops of a little old ladies coming out of Croydon station saying I didn't know anything about this psilocybin stuff but you know these nice people have given me this leaflet and they've told me and you know what now I'm going to go down to Chris Phillips constituency surgery and I'm going to ask him why aren't you doing this because my grandson needs this and my daughter needs this and you know I, I, we want to put a bit more pressure on because now the it's not a case of if, it's a case of when, and when might still be very far down the line and we'll lose a lot of people in the meantime, not just to depression and to suicide, but to alcoholism and to tobacco addiction and to everything else that is uh, holding us back. So we believe if we can move all of this forward by just one month, that will be people people's lives saved and that matters. So it's the thing that yeah gets us out uh, campaigning and hopefully will motivate people to to get involved and to and to come and just hit the streets of South Croydon with us with some leaflets and having some conversations and let's uh, drive that sense of urgency and maybe get Chris to realize that he wants to stand on the right side of history if he wants to have any legacy at all he will not let the next government make this change he will do it he will sign it and he will be proud of himself for doing it how can people support you aunt in croydon um they can come to croydon for one thing they can fund us they can share our materials and um they can come like all they need to do is sign up on our website uh silocybin.co.uk when you say sign up so what are they going to do go to the website just go to the website and join our newsletter because the other thing is that we're we're coming up with stuff all the time. They can they can help us. They can lend their skills. Um, we've it's amazing, really. I, I've been really totally blessed in that. Just when we've needed an accountant, an accountant has appeared. Just when we've needed a designer, a designer has appeared, and people have said, "Hey, I can do that. I've got the skills to do that." And they've lent in, and every one of us is a volunteer, and we give our time freely and our and our energy. I've got one, um, you know, amazing woman who is uh, like hand printing t-shirts that we've been selling uh, that we're selling at these festivals that are, again raising money for leaflets and postcards and stamps and things that we can use then to get people to lobby their mps can you buy the t-shirts online you can buy the t-shirts online soon you can be able to buy some of the other merchandise as well um you we've got letters um if you go to the website so we've got uh silocybin.co.uk if that's easier to remember or if you can't spell that par.global p a r dot global par dot global and that will you'll you can sign up to the newsletter where we can communicate what we're doing and how to get involved um you can you can sign up for all our social media you can donate you can buy stuff from the shop um we've only been we've only been doing this for a year literally a year last week it's been since we kind of formally have you launched. got any uh, method of collecting response uh, like uh Expressions of interest, shall we say, from people who are suffering from, let's say, PTSD. Yes, yes. For saying, hey, I'm interested. Yeah. I'd like to explore treatment for this as and when it's available. Yes. Please, can you um, help? There's a, at the moment, there's a button that says, tell us your story. We're probably going to change that slightly so that we're going to ask people for, um, if they've experienced psilocybin already and it's helped them uh, to, to share that with us so that we can maybe connect them to media if they're interested in talking to media we, we have quite a lot of requests from places like bbc gloucestershire and we need to find somebody in gloucestershire who has experienced the medicine who wants to talk about it but <clears throat> equally actually what we're finding now is the media are often coming to us and asking i want to talk to somebody who hasn't been able to experience the medicine who wants to for their depression for their ptsd for their cluster headaches whatever it might be because there's a lot of different use cases um, you know, and, and actually we're, we're going to start trying to collect testimonies from people who might be willing to talk to um, the media about the fact that they haven't been able to experience this medicine and they really, really want to. And that's great because that's, again, helping us drive the sense of urgency and not just sitting back and waiting for it to happen. It will happen. There is hope for humanity. These medicines are going to have their renaissance um, and hopefully 
we'll try and make sure that our politicians are as informed as possible to make sure that that can happen safely and freely and so that people aren't having situations like they are with ketamine clinics right now that are, you know, uh, in some cases in the UK charging £10,000 and having waiting lists uh, oh lasting many years. You know, it, we believe in access and equitable access for the people who want and need this. So um, we, we need to steward this through properly. It'll happen anyway, but we want it to happen well. And we want actually the UK to lead the world in, in this psychedelic uh, re renaissance, revolution maybe. Last question. How do people connect with you or follow you? Pardot Global. Um, the website is the best place because it's got the, all of the social media links. We're on Instagram, on Twitter, we're on uh, Facebook and all of those places. Um, but yeah, and there's a contact form so they can fill that in if they want to volunteer their time and energy. We meet every week as a, um, we have a weekly status meeting, a little, uh, our band of volunteers, and we talk about what we could do. All ideas welcome anyone who's got the energy to do stuff. It's really a case of come and join us and make it happen. Good. I really enjoyed this chat. Thank you for the, thank you for what you're doing with it. I really, I really thank believe you. in it. And um, I want to sign up on the website. I want to keep in touch yeah. and uh, try and get involved in Croydon when it yeah, launches why not? next year. 100%. We're going to have fun. I think we're going to go down there and, and yeah. put letter, you know, put leaflets through the letterboxes and kind of play the politicians at their own game. This is what they, this is what they do to influence us is they put leaflets through letterboxes and tell them, tell us vote for them, vote for them. Well, you know, we're going to try and do something similar. Um, and maybe it'll even be sooner if they pull an election, maybe we'll go down on those election days and, and just just put a little bit more pressure on. Uh, we want him to know that we're watching him and that he needs to do something. Cool. Thank you and good luck. Thank you.